Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and close this incredible week, inspiring week we've had together. Why don't you all give yourselves a big round of applause for making it here, making it this far, building this community. My name is Josh Friday. I get to have this incredibly unique role in California, Chief Service Officer overseeing civic engagement and service and activism in the state. And on behalf of Gavin Newsom, the governor in California, it's such an honor to be here. And, uh, and I just want to say, doesn't it feel good? Doesn't it feel good to be here, to walk away from this week together where we know how to act, we know what to do, we feel positive, we feel empowered, we know that when it comes to solving climate change, we are not powerless. That question of how do we create that feeling for everyone is what animates our work in California. So we believe that everyone, everyone needs to be part of the solution in our society. And we're taking bold action in California. The governor's invested $48 billion with a B in tackling climate change. It's, our, it's an existential threat that we take, we're not just take seriously, we're living every day. I'm worried about my flight being canceled tonight because of an atmospheric river that's going through the state right now. At the same time, we're facing droughts, wildfires, and everything else that we're seeing. But what we've done in California is say that we don't just need big policy and big ideas. We also need to mobilize the most important asset that we have in our state. And that's the 40 million people that call California home. And so we created three years ago the country's first statewide climate action core a climate core to mobilize Californians at scale to give people the opportunity, whether you have an hour to give or a year to give, we're creating the opportunity for Californians to get involved and take climate action. So far, we've had hundreds of fellows who get paid a $30,000 a year stipend and a $10,000 scholarship to put towards college to be climate organizers in low-income communities. We've created organizing events and volunteer events where literally tens of thousands of volunteers across the state have engaged in taking climate action in our state. And the, the impact has been incredible and it's, and it's inspiring and we're seeing people not just take climate action but, but build community and connection. I think of one, one really powerful person I met along the way, one of our Climate Action Corps fellows, a woman named Amaya who grew up in Compton, California who joined our Climate Action Corps so that she could learn the knowledge and the, and the skills and the experience to take back to her community in Compton and teach them and empower them to be sustainable and to act around climate. And this connection of building connection to each other and connection to community is at the heart of our work in California. And it's why we're here today to say, we hope that this work spreads all across the country. I heard an unbelievably powerful uh, story and, and line and sentiment from a, a really inspiring young leader yesterday named Marina, who said that when it comes to solving climate in our communities, we need to operate at the speed of trust. Trust is fundamental to our democracy. It's fundamental to us solving not just climate, but every issue. And it's why Governor Newsom has invested in creating uh, programs that people can come together to serve together, where people from very different backgrounds and experiences can have a common purpose, a common mission, and a common experience so we could deal with the polarization in our society, the isolation, the disconnection that we all know is so real. And we're doing this around climate change, but we've also created a college core program, we call it the California GI Bill, where we're creating debt-free pathways for students to serve while we help them pay for school. We've created a jobs core program, and we've created all these programs to rebuild that trust in our society that is so important for us to tackle climate change. Also heard something very powerful from one of our young leaders yesterday named Z, who said that we have to focus on healing our people and our communities because healing is what allows us to then think big when it comes to climate. And I was recently with a foster youth who said to me, do you know why if you ask foster youth what they want to be when they grow up, they often say, I want to be a teacher or a social worker? It's because service is what heals us. Service is what heals us. 
Service through our climate core is what's going to heal our communities, bring us together, allow us to solve problems together once again, and it's going to heal our planet. So we want everyone who's interested to please join us at climateactioncore.ca.gov. We want to partner with you all. We also believe that every state should have a climate core. Every city should have a climate core. Our entire country should have a climate core. Because service is how we're going to heal a society that has become disconnected and isolated and polarized, and we all feel that. And it's also how we're going to heal our planet. I look forward to serving with all of you. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you very much for uh, having me here today to talk about Babcock Ranch, a new town that we're building in uh, southwest Florida. So Babcock Ranch is located just 12 miles outside of uh, Fort Myers. And so we purchased a 91,000 acre ranch back in 2006. Put that in perspective, that's 143 square miles. And then we sold 73,000 acres to the state of Florida in the largest land purchase in the history of the, of the state. And because of that purchase, there's now a wildlife corridor that stretches from Lake Okeechobee all the way to the Charlotte Harbor estuary. So on the remaining land, we're, uh, we're building now a new town that'll have about uh, 20,000 homes and 6 million square feet of commercial space and a population of about 55,000 people. But to do that, we had, uh, we had 18,000 acres remaining, and out of the 18,000 acres, we're preserving half of that. So at the end of the day, 90% of the original ranch is in preservation forever. So our goal was, was to set out and prove that a new town and the environment can work hand in hand. And we did that by identifying seven key initiatives that really have become the heart and soul of Babcock Ranch. Uh, they, in, they in, include uh, things like uh, the environment, energy, education, technology, transportation, health and wellness, and storm safety. We believe that we could execute these initiatives through innovation, uh, becoming a, a Lehman laboratory, and an incubator for new ideas. So, you know, until last September, we were known as America's first solar-powered town. We have a 150 megawatt solar power generating facility on Babcock Ranch, and it, it powers the in, entire town. Just put that in perspective, that's 700,000 panels on about 840 acres. We also had the first solar to battery facility uh, that in the United States. But then came Hurricane Ian, and the focus shifted for us from renewable energy and sustainability to resiliency, although I will tell you, I really believe that they are, they are one and the same. So we had, uh, at the time, about 5,000 residents, all living at Babcock Ranch. I can remember assuring them, telling them that they could all shelter at home and that they would be safe sheltering at home. So to back up that, uh, that very bold statement, we spent years with our engineers and our architects and land planners designing a new town that would be safe for both our homeowners and for our businesses. But I got to tell you something, Ian put all that preparation, all that, uh, that hard work and planning everything to the ultimate test. When the hurricane hit, the eastern side of the eye wall sat on top of us for eight hours. We had sustained winds of 100 miles an hour, gusts of over 150 miles an hour. I got to tell you, I was sitting in my house, and it was like this perpetual freight train running right through us. And it just seemed like it was, it was never, never going to end. But throughout this relentless storm, Babcock Ranch residents never lost power, they never lost water, and they never lost internet. And when the storm was over and they emerged from their homes, they discovered that they were living in a community that had little uh, to no damage. So now the question we're getting asked is, is what do we do at Badcock Ranch to survive a strong Category 4 hurricane? So for us, there's, the resilience really started with our location. So Babcock is 30 feet above, above sea level, above the storm surge. That was no accident. People would say to me, gosh, you're so lucky you were that high in the air. And, and there was no luck about it. It was very purposeful. We wanted to develop and build this town in a place that was, that was above the storm surge. And our master plan started with the study of the land and the natural systems. So we decided to work with nature 
rather than against it. So what do we do? We went back and started looking at maps from 1940 to find the natural flowways and then design a comprehensive water management system that mimics the way Mother Nature has been doing it for centuries. Because I can tell you, one thing is for sure, you cannot mess with Mother Nature. She's going to win every single time. So also, we have these extensive wetlands that you're seeing up here on the screen that are located throughout the community. We preserved them. We kept them. We enhanced them. They're gorgeous. But they also uh, provide this massive amount of surf surface water storage that was incredibly helpful for us. All our stormwater ponds and lakes have multiple points of uh, interconnection and have a smart stormwater management system, brand new, new technology that's coming out that has also been incredibly helpful for us. We require native plant materials because they do really well in wet weather, they do well in dry weather, and they do well in the wind. We also hardened our water and wastewater utility that we own and, and operate, making sure that they could handle the wind loads. You know, this may sound sort of you know, obvious and simple, but reinvesting back into the plant and keeping up with the maintenance is, uh, and, and, and really implementing all the, two uh, the uh, new technologies is critical to the performance of these uh, facilities. And you'd be, you'd be surprised how, how poorly many of the water utilities are maintained uh, throughout our country and how inefficient they all have become. So I think if you talk to most of the homeowners who live at Babcock Ranch, they'll tell you that having the electricity stay on throughout the hurricane was a game changer. They were able to literally watch this thing as it came over the top of us and, uh, and, and watched it uh, real time. So many news reports credited our solar fields and our backup battery uh, systems with keeping the lights on. But that uh, really wasn't the case. It was uh, Florida Power and Light's storm-hardened transmission systems combined with our underground power lines that kept the electricity on. We spent eight years working with the utility, Florida Power and Light, to make that a reality. And like I said, we got tested. In addition, all of our structures must meet uh, Florida Green Build coalition, coalition standards, which focus on resiliency as well as uh, energy efficiency. And I think you would all agree, like all uh, construction throughout Florida, we benefit from these strong building codes that have been extremely effective in mitigating wind damage. So I get asked the question all the time, does, does this cost more? Well, yes, it does. And it's a great investment. The cost is nominal compared to the loss of property, the loss of productivity, and the loss of life. And we hope to inspire other developers and communities to understand the value of investing in resiliency. Because I, I, I'll tell you, we're confident that the private and public sectors can work together to solve today's challenges. So I stand here before you telling you I am incredibly optimistic about our future. And, I, and I'll tell you, there's just this real enthusiasm that we see from all generations to solve these issues. At Babcock Ranch, is multi-generational. The baby boomers care as much as the young people care. And that's why we're going to be able to get through this and, and, and make, this, make this work. And, and, uh, and look, we have, we have innovative companies and people who, with new technologies that are going to make this a safer world. And you know what? That's good news for our kids and our grandkids. And I'm very proud that Babcock Ranch is a leader in resiliency, sustainability, and innovation, and can really be a model for future development. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Jason. Jason is relatively unique in this world in that he really does wear two seemingly very different hats. He's uh, the co-founder uh, of the Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy, where they really focus on geopolitics of energy, largely but not exclusively oil and gas. Uh, and increasingly things like renewables and really the geopolitics of all energy. At the same time, he's also the head of the nation's very first climate school. Uh, and so for problems that are as global as energy and climate, I think we all need more people like Jason. Uh, before I ask him some questions, I have two questions for everybody out in the audience, making sure everybody's still awake after their lunch. Uh, tiredness. The first question is, raise your hand if you've heard of Sierra Week or been there. 
Okay, not that many hands. Uh, it's a big uh, energy conference in Houston that is just getting wrapped up now. It's historically been largely oil and gas, but increasingly uh, other technologies and energy sources as well. Second question, raise your hand if you think oil and gas companies could or should fill some sort, sort of role in addressing climate change. <laughs> okay, I see a lot more hands. Uh, Jason is just coming, us, coming to us fresh from Sarah Week. Jason, I would love your reaction to what you just saw in the audience. And what are your observations at Sarah Week that you think this audience should know? Yeah, well, thanks uh, to Aspen Institute and um, Greg and the whole energy environment team for the invitation to be here and many more journalists uh, and experts like you, Amy, too. And you kind of know these worlds incredibly well. We probably would have gotten a similar reaction if you'd asked in Sierra Week, who was aware there was, it's a little bit more recent than Sierra Week, which has been around 40 years, an Aspen Ideas Climate Festival in Miami. But it's, the I think, the world's biggest energy conference, uh, as Amy said, started with a focus in what you would expect in Houston, but a but huge number of clean tech companies that were there this year and clean tech uh, investors. I think, it, it, these are two stark realities that we need, I think, increasingly to understand, uh, and we need more people in Houston to understand the conversations here in Miami and, and maybe vice versa. So, you know, the two realities, one of them was much discussed in Houston, which is that the world is in an energy crisis right now, not quite as bad as we thought it would be or could have been in Europe. But, but this is a multi-year crisis. Europe is still paying incredibly high natural gas prices that are causing industries uh, to, leave, to leave Europe. Uh, it's having ripple effects around the world with very high energy prices in emerging and developing economies that are hitting them particularly hard, pretty high and probably increasing oil prices that make the geopolitical influence of dominant oil-producing states like in OPEC more consequential. Uh, not, not less. And, and, and you saw this reality with the Secretary of Energy of the Biden administration in Houston at this conference yesterday, thanking the oil and gas industry for increasing oil and gas supply and saying, please do more of that. So there was a conversation there about the energy reality of meeting, the uh, reality of meeting today's energy needs around the world. This year, oil and gas demand, oil demand will go up about two million barrels a day. Oil supply will go up about one million barrels a day. When demand exceeds supply, prices go up, and that leads to economic and political problems that we've seen politicians don't like. There's another reality, which is emissions are going up each and every year. Uh, we haven't yet bent the curve, and if you care about targets based in science, like net zero by 2050, or limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we're almost out of time. And so the conversation in Houston was one about being more realistic and balanced. And if by realistic and balanced you mean we need a lot of solutions on the table, not just renewables, but carbon capture and carbon removal and hydrogen, that makes sense. If realistic means we need to understand the needs of the developing world and how big those numbers are to meet their energy needs, that's entirely true. If it means we just can't move that fast and we need to grow clean energy quickly, but we're still gonna be using 100 million barrels of oil a day 10, 20, 30 years from now, that is not consistent with the reality of what we need to do to decarbonize really fast. If we continue uh, with current emissions levels, we've used up the carbon budget consistent with 1.5 within less than a decade. Uh, and these two, ten these two realities are, um, are, are increasingly in tension as, as, as uh, as we fail to accelerate this transition as much as we need to. Many of us may have seen the news that uh, BP, uh, of course the oil giant uh, from <coughs> Europe, is uh, pulling back on its plans to reduce uh, its oil and gas production in, in the coming years. A couple of years ago it had announced it would slash its um, oil and gas production, I think 40%, uh, and, and it's pulling back on that. Uh, and what happened uh, when BP made that announcement? Jason. Their share price went up 15%. So what does that say? Does that say we need to get rid of capitalism, or are all of those investors wrong? 
Well, I think with the, some of those, and there are different investors, right? There are different investor bases. There are investor bases that clearly want to put more capital into clean energy, and that investor base, I live in New York City, you see it every day with the number of multi-billion dollar funds that are, propping, are crop, cropping up to support clean energy. Uh, they want to see more capital going into companies that are all about the energy transition, which these companies aren't yet. Um, and then there are those who want to see the returns they're used to from oil and gas production. It's more cyclical, it's more volatile, it goes up and down, but when times are good, they're really good. And we're in a period now where returns are pretty good. They haven't been for the last 10 years, but that's where we're headed now. And so it is a tricky <laughs> landscape for some of these companies to navigate. We need to push them, we need them to lead, we need them to shift capital from, uh, I, I did a podcast, I have a, I have a podcast, the one this week was with the CEO of Equinor, Nor Norway's uh, partly state-owned energy company, and he said he was in New York, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm meeting with investors, and I said, what are they, what, what are they saying to you? And he said, a lot of them want, are asking if we can shift CapEx from renewables to oil and gas, because they see the returns there are higher. So what we need to do did is push... Did he say that that's what they're going to do? He said they're not going to do that, and, and, maybe, and, and maybe Equinor has a little more leeway because they do have part ownership by the state and a state that is interested. But to be clear, nor, you know, they're still producing a lot of oil and gas. Um, but but we, what we need is a, to A, to have these companies move, but also to create a broad economic and financial landscape and policy ecosystem that makes it pro very financially profitable for them to do so. We need to be in a place where if a company announces they're slowing the pace of withdrawal from oil and gas, uh, as BP did recently, the market penalizes that, not rewards it. A lot of us are hearing about the upcoming uh, United Nations Climate Conference and the United Arab Emirates for later this year. You, you know, critics will point out that, you know, on its face, at the very best, it's questionable that a fossil fuel powerhouse, which is UAE and also a member of OPEC, should be hosting a climate conference. Critics say it's, you know, the, the wolf guarding the hen house. What can, what constructive role can fossil fuel countries play in addressing climate change? And what do you make of that criticism that is coming around the COP? It's, a, I think, a high-stakes COP. Look, this is the stock-taking COP. It's where we sit and look at one another and say, are we where we need to be or not? And the answer is clearly not. And the question is, what do we do about that? Um, it is important to engage emerging and developing economies, as we saw in Egypt, which was kind of the Africa COP. Uh, important to engage regions of the world, like the Gulf, uh, which have a lot of low-cost uh, uh, low cost oil and gas, uh, but also a lot of clean energy opportunity, and think about how to engage different parts of the world in this conversation. I think it's really important to increasingly, and this is an opportunity, it's not without risk, but this is an opportunity for hosting the COP in a place like that, to, to have a more of a conversation than we almost ever do about the role of state-owned enterprises and national oil companies. Uh, we talk a lot about Exxon and BP and Shell and Chevron. Th those so-called super majors are 15% of the world's oil and gas supply. Most of the world's oil and gas comes from state-owned companies. And we're not gonna be able to have a transition until we figure out how to engage, and they, they respond to different incentives, Sometimes they can move faster, but sometimes they're not subject to the same social pressures, divestment pressures, ESG pressures that you do with the large financial institutions or, or shareholders, uh, the way we were talking about with BP a moment ago. So we're in a world now where we are, we're at risk, uh, as I've been writing about and, and as the International Energy Agency, Fatih Broll, talked about in the most recent World Energy Outlook, of failing to synchronize declines in oil supply with declines in oil demand. We need them kind of both to fall faster, but both to fall somewhat in tandem. And right now, as I said, you know, we, we, are, we are not where, we are, oil and gas investment is below where it would normally be at this point in an oil price cycle, and you might say that's great. It's, it's, it, it, it can be great if oil demand is going down too. Oil demand, as I said, will rise two million barrels a day this year. And if, demand grows but supply doesn't, one of two things happens. You get high prices and tight markets and price volatility, and you see how politicians respond to that, including the Biden administration, which released 200 million barrels last year from our strategic petroleum reserve to try to keep oil prices and gasoline prices from going up. 
Or if there's a gap, then you get more investment and more supply from some of the state-owned enterprises we're talking about that are not subject to the same social pressures. Right now, which countries are spending tens of billions of dollars to increase how much oil they can produce in 2030? Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, that's where the investment is coming from. You mentioned uh, the emerging economy of Egypt and the fact that that's who hosted the COP last year. I anticipate we'll hear a lot about uh, the energy needs of emerging countries uh, at this next COP. Sometimes it can be seen as if the fossil fuel industry is using that as sort of a crutch to say, hey, let's continue to use fossil fuels. At the same time, these countries do need energy. A lot of times it's going to be something like natural gas to power their economies. At the same time, these countries are dealing with more extreme weather and don't have the, the <coughs> financial capability to handle them. Jason, how do you sort of respond to that criticism that, oh, this is just how fossil fuel companies uh, say they need to continue using fossil fuels in the developing world? How, why is this such an important topic and how do you think we should think about it? Yeah, look, I think that criticism is valid uh, in, 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 some, in some or many cases. This is a huge priority for the world. It's a huge priority for us at Columbia University, at the Center on Global Energy Policy. We just started what we call the Energy Opportunity Lab, co-led by Andrew Kamau, who's here, who just left the Ministry of Energy in Kenya. Uh, Columbia has a global center in Kenya. We, we were increasingly spending a lot of time thinking about emerging and developing economies. That's where the emissions growth is coming from. Not where the emissions have been in the past, to be clear. These are the parts of the world that did not cause this problem, have emitted almost no CO2 to date because they use so little energy per capita, uh, don't have the resources to cope with the impacts of climate or to necessarily grow in a cleaner uh, way than, than they have in the past. And we see that every day, right? I mean, Pakistan, a third underwater, in part significantly exacerbated by the impacts of climate change, uh, and seeing rolling blackouts and struggling to afford energy because of the global energy crisis we're in and the very high natural gas prices that were exacerbated by Russia's cutting off supplies uh, to much of Europe. In response to that, Pakistan recently said they're reversing their plans to use nat liquefied natural gas, and what are they doing? They're using more renewables, but they're also quadrupling coal capacity. And so we need to make low carbon, zero carbon energy affordable for these parts of the world by de-risking investment. We need something like three or four trillion dollars a year in total uh, by 2050 in a net zero scenario, about half a trillion to a trillion just by 2030 in the developing world. Most of that will be private capital, but a lot has to be uh, catalyzed by, by public uh, investment. And renewables and, and other forms of clean energy often compete favorably, uh, but there are barriers to putting capital to work in many of these parts of the world. That's why the cost of capital is anywhere from three to seven times higher, so those projects are not always bankable. We just did a piece of work at Columbia on uh, piloting a project to a, a coverage facility to mitigate currency exchange risk. That's just one example of one of the barriers where you're investing in dollars, but you're recovering in local currency, and currency exchange risk can be a big barrier to investment, but, but there are many of those. I think directly to your question about is this a crutch or an excuse, uh, I think it's a, a, it can be, but, but it's a reality. The reality is the developing world needs a lot more energy to not just turn on cell phones and have electricity access or turn on light bulbs, uh, power cell phones, but have meaningful levels of growth, even a fraction of what we all take for granted, mechanized agriculture, have industry, have, have transportation. Those are big numbers. The problem is when I think people in the industry say, therefore, we need to grow clean energy, but we also still need to keep growing oil and gas. Like that just fundamental basic arithmetic tells you that can't happen. <laughs> a net zero world is not no oil and gas. We still have some carbon capture. You look at all the models from the IEA or elsewhere, but there's no way we're getting to our climate goals and continuing to use today's level of oil and gas. We have to be using a lot less. Those, that, that's, that's just the math of climate change. And the math, uh, the math of climate change is unforgiving, and the math of meeting the world's energy needs is unforgiving too, and that's the tension we have to reconcile. We have heard a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act here, and I know it was a big topic at Sierra Week as well. Uh, the, the U.S. Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm, uh, Jason has already mentioned her, she has used this term, coopetition, to describe the, the perfect balance between some competition and some collaboration. Uh, many of us have probably seen the headlines about how Europe is scrambling to respond to all of the subsidies in the IRA. Yeah. Uh, these protectionist measures could have a negative impact. Jason, is it even possible to strike competition? 
Yeah, it's an interesting phrase because I think it. I think when you said it first, or when it was said first, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, and we could talk about it if you want, is is China, right? Do you need does the U, do the U.S. and China need to cooperate on climate? Because that is not happening and seems unlikely to happen anytime soon in a meaningful way. But it is competition that is both spurring China to invest heavily to dominate solar, dominate the battery supply chain, and bringing down the cost, so it's all more affordable. But now it's also competition that's driving the US to respond with things like the Inflation Reduction Act, which are historic climate measures to accelerate clean energy. I think with Europe, Europe is, is, as I see it, they're sort of upset with two things about the Inflation Reduction Act. One I have a little sympathy with, one I have almost no sympathy with. You know, one is that it is industrial policy. The Inflation Reduction Act was designed to boost American economic competitiveness, and if you want the tax credits, much of the activity has to be done with components or, or, or parts and, and manufacturing that was done in the US, or sometimes neighboring countries or free trade countries, and Europe's like, well, what about us? We want support for our, our company should be able to compete too. Like, our auto companies. The, there are some flexible ways the Biden administration can implement this law to accommodate those, but, but that, you know, I, I think we need more, not less trade in clean energy if we're going to have the, a transition at the pace we need. So I'm not a huge fan of protectionist barriers. I think the bigger concern is just that we're subsidizing clean energy too much. These tax credits are too generous. And if you're sitting in Europe and you're thinking about building a green hydrogen company, now you have a $3 per kilogram tax credit, and you're like, well, it makes more economic sense to go to the Gulf Coast. I don't think we should be apologizing after decades of being criticized for not doing enough on climate for suddenly doing too much on climate. Uh, it is a good thing, not a bad thing, that we're putting a lot of government money into supporting uh, clean energy, and hopefully other, uh, other countries can, can do the same, not all have the same fiscal resources, but we need, a, we need a virtuous cycle of competition to race to the top to support more clean energy more while trying to mitigate the pitfalls of a vicious cycle of competition uh, of, of sort of that would lead to protectionism. The world is going to need a whole plethora of new materials to power the clean energy transition. Think raw minerals and uh, everything uh, down from that. Jason, how can we ensure that we access these minerals extremely fast, but in a way that's respectful of indigenous communities and environmental standards? And before you get to that answer, you know, very pointedly, who or what will be the new OPEC of the clean <laughs> energy future? Um, it's a really important issue. I think there's growing recognition of how important this is. The lithium, cobalt, manganese, all the all the minerals that are needed for batteries and for solar and wind and and your cell phone. I mean, almost everything that we use. Uh, if we're in a net zero by 2050 scenario, I think the IEA shows us increasing critical mineral demand sixfold. I mean, these are big, big numbers, uh, and 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 most of these these are much more heavily concentrated. So. You know, the largest oil producing states, US, Russia, Saudi Arabia, each produce 10% of world supply. The largest producer of, uh, of, of, of lithium, of cobalt, you sort of go down the list, each of the largest producers in most cases is producing more than 50% of the world supply. So at least today they're much more heavily concentrated. That doesn't seem to be that they have to be. You can, they do exist in other places. We just have to develop those supply chains. And then the, the mining, the production is in, in Africa, it's in Australia, it's in different places, almost all of the refining and processing, which is a critical part of the supply chain, uh, for most of these happens in China. And those take a lot of time and a lot of capital to, to diversify. Uh, Megan O'Sullivan, who's at Harvard, who is my co-author on lots of things I do, she and I are co-chairing a task force for the Aspen Institute developing a critical mineral strategy for the US. I think that will come out shortly in the next uh, month or two, and that's been a fascinating process because this is a huge priority for the transition. It is a potential national security risk, to your point, if certain countries dominate those supply chains. It's not quite the same as oil, which if like the daily flow of oil was cut off, your car wouldn't work anymore. This is not the flow of electricity, but it is the input to new, new, new products, new solar panels. You know, you'd have problems with supply chains where the co e there would be breakdowns in the EV supply chain and you wouldn't, you know, the cost of new EVs would go up, that sort of thing. Um, so we need, we need a lot more attention uh, paid to that to diversify supply chains and more agreements with partner and friendly countries to diversify and, and develop those supply chains. And to just one last point, 
as you said, this means a lot of mining, right? I'm a trustee of the Nature Conservancy in New York. As we've talked about, it's a great organization that's protected the environment for years and years. Not a huge fan of lots and lots of mining. These have environmental implications. A lot of these resources in the US exist on public lands, federal lands, tribal lands. Uh, we were out there with this task force visiting the Resolution Copper Mine in Arizona and visiting the sacred tribal sites that would be affected by it. It is really hard. The average, it takes 16 years on average to, to, to develop a new mine around the world right now, but we need to move really fast for an energy transition. So this is a hard problem to solve, but we need a lot of community consultation, bring those communities into the process earlier, not later. Think about which sites are best suited for these. Not all will be, uh, but you're gonna have to do a lot more mining if you wanna have a clean energy transition, and you know, that's, that's, there's downsides to that. In our final moments together, I want to conclude with a lightning round. I'm going to say a word, and then you say the very first word and only one word uh, that pops into your head when I say that word. Uh, the first one is... Terror right now. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I, I've heard through my sources that he was very worried about this part because I did not give these words, uh, I did not give them to him ahead of time. Uh, the first word is carbon offsets. Uh... <laughs> One word, one word response. Oh, a there. phrase, <laughs> two or three words, but no uh, sentences. Uh, yeah, well, uh, potentially useful and not without risk of, 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 of abuse, not without risk That's of abuse. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You, you, you'd be surprised about how many people violate <laughs> these rules. Second word is nuclear power. Um, optimism and necessary for decarbonization. Carbon tax? Carbon tax. Carbon tax. <laughs> Uh, a, a really good policy, but not the only policy that can decarbonize. Our final two, natural gas. Uh, carbon emitting, <laughs> greenhouse gas emitting, and different time frames for different parts of the world to decarbonize. And final, uh, China. Um, Coal, biggest emitter, <laughs> uh, biggest growth in, 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 in clean energy. Um, I mean, coal is the first thing that comes to mind. It's 30% of the world's, 50% uh, of the world's coal use, 30% of emissions, and, and it's still building new coal plants. That has to change quickly. Jason, I want to say a big thank you for this conversation and to the audience. I would like to start this presentation by asking you to close your eyes take a deep breath and think about the Amazon rainforest. Now, what's the first thing that came to mind? Over the past few years, I've been asking this question to very different people, and the answers always look the same. And everyone evokes something like this. A beautiful forest full of trees, oxygen for us to breathe, and a key ecosystem when we address climate change. And it's not a coincidence that we all think the exact same way, because photography plays, plays a key role on this. Photography is a powerful medium that has been there introducing us to places that we've never seen. But what happens if we are offered the same perspective again and again? We will be probably in front of a stereotype. And when it comes to the Amazon rainforest, it's a big stereotype. So that's why I like to ask, what about the 30 million people living in the Amazon? And especially, what about the indigenous peoples living in the Amazon? Why aren't they being on every climate change, climate change discussion if being only 5% of the world population, they preserve 80% of the world's biodiversity? As a visual storyteller, my work is to go beyond this green wall of streets and to look for these human underreported stories to address the climate change problem from a different perspective. Throughout these years, I learned that part of the answer lays in the concept of territory and how different this concept could be between them and us. For us, the land is something to be conquered. It's something that we want to make profit out of it. We even created terms like unproductive lands to call these lands that are not producing wealth. 
But for them, that's a totally different story. That rainforest is their mother, is their grandfather. That rainforest, as they say, is the supermarket, is their pharmacy. And even when it was completely destroyed and now turned into soybean fields that extend to the horizon, it is, it is still being sacred because below their feet, there's hundreds of generations that are still resting. So I started thinking, how could I tell photographically in a single image this powerful bond between these land defenders and the land that they fiercely defend? And I started photographing them from the bird's eye view. And now I have this subject and their land as the background. But then I realized I needed a second picture, a second portrait of the land in question. And now both are together. There's no rainforest without the people. There's no people without the rainforest. So he is Betty Cre. He's an indigenous from the Xingu Indigenous Park in Brazil. And that is the circular shaped village where he lives with his family. But they are being threatened by the expansion of agribusiness, by the expansion of wood logging. And they are using technology to create proof about what they are facing so they can basically make the authorities to take action. Deep inside in the rainforest in Ecuadorian Amazon, Nantu is a young leader that is preserving that pristine rainforest that you can see over there. This is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world because of the encounter of the Amazon rainforest with the Andes Mountains. What they are doing is to create these solar-powered boats so they can reduce their dependence on oil, which is creating a huge disaster in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Back to Brazil, Drica is a young teacher. She's descendants from African slaves but that managed to find refuge in the rainforest. She has been elected the first woman to be the president for the five communities that she represents. But she has a lot of things to deal with. Wood logging, and they live right next to that huge bauxite mine. Bauxite is a mineral used to produce aluminum. That tiny part that you can see in the picture is one by one mile. But deep inside the forest, Behind the canopy, it's a 15 by 15 mile. I mean, you can see that from space. Drika, as a teacher, believes in the power of education to tell young people how important it is to defend the land. Because at the end of the day, you only defend what you love. These are just a few stories of this human journey of resistance in the Amazon. And with the support of the National Geographic Society, I will keep documenting these stories, these men and women struggling for their lands, but also struggling for us. So I would say that we should really listen to them. We should, daily, we should really make them, part, make them part of the climate conversation. Because as a Brazilian indigenous philosopher said, whose name is Ailton Krenaki. Indigenous are experts in managing the end of the world. They started to face it 500 years ago, and the ones who am I worried about is you, the Western people. So before finishing, I would like to ask you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and think of the Amazon rainforest. Now, what's the first thing that came to mind? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I wanted to tell you how appropriate, even necessary, I believe the Aspen Ideas Climate Initiative is and how receptive I am to the request made to me to talk about Monaco's strategy to address climate change. In Miami, climate change is no longer a distant vision. You have already seen and felt the consequences. Each of us must therefore, with the resources they have available, must make the decisions without delay to limit it, mitigate its effects, and leave future generations a healthy planet. In the Principality of Monaco, our greenhouse gas emissions emanate primarily from three sources, each representing approximately one-third of our emissions, heating of buildings, waste treatment, and mobility. 
It is by working on these issues that we set ourselves the target to reduce our emissions by 55% by 2023 compared to the baseline of 1990 to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Emissions from buildings require essentially technical solutions. We have banned the use of fuel for heating in a few years' time. This will undoubtedly also be the case for gas, since carbon-free nuclear and renewable power covers most of our needs. We are drastically reducing the amount of waste to be treated thanks to an increasingly selective sorting system with a view to its recycling. As for mobility, in Monaco as elsewhere, this is a complex challenge because from the Formula One to recreational vehicles, we have always loved cars with powerful combustion engines. To change things, it would therefore be unrealistic to ban them completely in the short term. However, we are investing in electric mobility, focusing on the practical factors, with free charging points readily available throughout the country. Focusing on the health factors, we improved air quality, and focusing on the appeal factors with the Formula E Grand Prix and the E Rally, which turned the spotlight on the tremendous prospects offered by electric and possibly hydrogen vehicles as well. We have done the same for our public transportation with a network of buses that will be fully electric by 2025. This is how, by facilitating everyone's life and offering them an opportunity to keep dreaming, we will be able to combat climate change in the mobility sector as well as other sectors such as food, industry, and tourism. I hope that your discussions today will enable you to move further down this path. Thank you. I don't mean to be dramatic, but we are undergoing a biodiversity crisis, and that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, it is directly related to the climate crisis, and yet oftentimes um, is you know, sort of on the sidelines of that conversation. I, I can't really imagine two better people to speak with about this than Monica Medina, uh, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International and Scientific Affairs, as well as the Special Envoy for Biodiversity and Water Resources, which is a long way of saying that she's at the center of the Biden administration's efforts on these biodiversity issues, and Gerardo Ceballos, who is an ecologist and conservationist at the National Autonomous uh, University of Mexico and a leading uh, researcher over the past decades on this topic. Um, we're, we're going to talk about solutions, but, but Gerardo, I want to start with you just to, to sort of set the stage. Um, you know, uh, most people here probably know there's a biodiversity crisis, but can you just give us the context of, you know, how bad is it? Well, thank you very, very much, Monica. Thank you very much. Well, um, every we all know about the climate change problem, but actually the biodiversity problem is more urgent and is uh, more acute. So uh, it's often called the silent crisis because we hardly see the animals that are becoming extinct and the uh, habitats. And just to give you an idea, the number of species that become extinct in the last 100 years, and we know only 2% of the species that live in this planet, but the vertebrates, mammal birds, reptiles, and amphibians that become extinct in the last 100 years, will have taken 10,000 years to become extinct under normal times. If the species that are on the brink of extinction become extinct in the next 20, 50 years, the rate of extinction that will have taken 2,500,000 2, years to become extinct. That's the magnitude. And the extinction crisis is the only irreversible crisis, climate, uh, environmental crisis, because one species is gone, it is gone. Let me give you very quickly one example. There were 10 million elephants in 1990, in, in, in the 1900s. There were only 1.3 million in the 1970s. There are around 300,000 now, and we're losing one elephant every 30 minutes by the legal trade. There will be no elephants in the wild, probably, in 20, 25 years if this continues. So, the uh, problem, the environmental crisis is uh, huge, it's gigantic, it's unseen, but it's the basis to solve, as we will see in a few minutes, the uh, part of the climate crisis. 
Well, th yeah, thank you for, for grounding this conversation. Um, you know, Monica, I opened by saying that, uh, that the issues, these issues oftentimes uh, don't receive the attention they deserve, but at the same time, there are many ongoing conversations, uh, which, as I said, you're at the center of. Uh, the High Seas Treaty was agreed, I guess, less than a week ago. There's the Convention on Biodiversity discussions that happened last year, the plastics negotiations ongoing. Um, the list could go on and on. But, but I, I want to ask you to just... Uh, you know, give us a, an overview of the efforts and what, what do they all add up to? Thank you, Justin. It's such an honor to be here on this panel with so many other uh, wonderful people helping to close out this incredible um, convening by the Aspen Institute. It was, uh, we had a big group of people here from the administration, so this is an important conversation. I want to thank the Vice President for coming and Ali Zaidi, the um, President's Climate Advisor, for coming. This is really an important topic for the Biden administration. We are working very, very hard to bring together all the powers that we have through the government, whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis because we know that we cannot tackle the climate crisis without uh, conserving biodiversity. 30%. 30% of what we need to do to solve the climate crisis will have to be done through biodiversity conservation and natural, nature-based solutions. So there you have it. Now, the biodiversity crisis is driven by more than just the climate crisis, but we can s help to solve the climate crisis. In fact, we must by working on the biodiversity crisis. So that's, to me, why the agreements that we're working on are so important. So let me mention the three that you talked about. The Convention on Biological Diversity. It's a global agreement. It's been in place for decades. The U.S. isn't even a member of this, but we participated actively in a meeting in December, the most recent conference of the parties, COP, where the world agreed to a global biodiversity framework goal of 30% of the planet conserved by 2030. That's huge. We had never set out that kind of ambitious goal. You know, the 1.5 degree goal for climate is a really ambitious goal. We needed one for biodiversity, and we got it. And most interestingly, China and Canada co-chaired the final uh, meeting where that agreement was achieved. So really big coming together of the world around that. But how do you do that if the ocean isn't part of the deal? Most of the ocean, 50% of the planet, is in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas. And until last weekend, we didn't have a way to protect any of that from all the various different uses that are covered under something called the Law of the Sea Treaty. But last weekend, the world came together again, and we haven't agreed the text formally, but we have agreed, or we haven't agreed the convention or the agreement formally, but we have agreed on the words. The text is frozen, it's being translated now, but within the next couple of months, the world will come together again and agree on how we can actually achieve conservation on the high seas. That's huge. And I'm really pleased that it got so much media attention, Justin. So I hope that um, the media will continue to write about this important crisis in biodiversity. The last way we're really tackling it now, in a big way, is through plastic pollution. We have a, we're drowning in plastic. <laughs> Amazing statistic. For every person on the planet, there are 21,000 pieces of plastic in the ocean today, and within six years, that will double. Six years, that will double. We are drowning in plastic. And the world, again, came together in the last year, just a year ago, to decide to start another global agreement on conserving, uh, on uh, protecting from plastic pollution, on ending plastic pollution. And we in the U.S. government are working very hard to drive ambition in that agreement. And hopefully we'll set a really big goal, a big, ambitious, high target, we hope it will be ending plastic pollution by 2040. So it is important for governments to come together and make these agreements and drive change, just like um, 
others in the, pa in the previous segments have talked about. Um, we need indigenous peoples. I was really moved again by the previous um, presentation by the Nat Geo Explorer talking about indigenous peoples. We must include them in this discussion. They are the best stewards uh, over hundreds of years and we need their expertise and we need their help because they do have so much biodiversity within their, their control. The last thing I'll say is finance. Without finance, we won't be able to conserve and protect biodiversity. And that's something that we in the U.S. government are really focused on right now. We are the largest contributor to the Global Environment Facility. We increased our contribution last year when it was re-upped. And now there's almost $2 billion in that facility that will be dedicated to nature finance. But it's hard to put a value and find finance for things that we've taken for granted for decades, thousands of years, even they're free, essentially. We have to change that. We have to change the way we think about nature and biodiversity and value it so that we can ensure that we will continue to protect it. Well, I, I, I want to just ask one very quick follow-up, uh, if you can, because I, and I want to underscore how important this high seas uh, agreement is. How, you know, 2030 is, is, is just around the corner, really. How do you get there? How do you protect 30% of the world's high seas by then? We have to really now uh, explode out of the blocks trying to create these agreements. And the, the new um, uh, treaty that we've negotiated requires us to go out and work through the other bodies that already control bits of the ocean. So there's a body that controls deep seabed mining, and there are a bunch of bodies that control regional high, uh, fishing in the high seas. And we'll have to identify areas, go work through those bodies. But if the parties to this agreement decide that they think an area is deserving of conservation, then every country that agrees to that We'll have to go and vote in those other places. So we have a mechanism now to kind of bring everyone together around high seas protection. And that's going to get us a long way. We already have one big sort of high seas area in the Antarctic. There's an RFMO, a regional fishery management organization in the North Atlantic that's protected an area. And there are lots of areas being identified right now as we speak to start to um, make the case and draw the lines, literally draw the lines on the map to create protection. We also have to work hard on land. And that's where climate and uh, nature and biodiversity and biodiversity finance and climate finance can all come together to help us conserve the Amazon and the Congo and all the parts around, the, all the places around the world that will be those natural carbon sinks that we cannot get to the solution without. Great. So, Gerardo, I want to come to you and, and just ask, and we've been talking about uh, international agreements, and then you know how does that uh, you know play out in you know national governments? But could you just talk a little bit about what all this might look like or mean at a local level? Well, yes. First of all, I would like to say that in terms of the extinction crisis, the good news is that there's still time. The bad news is that it's rapidly closing. The opportunity is rapidly closing. What's happened in the next 15 or 20 years will define what the species are left on the planet. And as Monica says properly, that 30% is 30 by 30 is very ambitious. It's not enough. What we have to do is to protect every single ecosystem and we try to restore every single species that is in the planet now. Unless we do something like that at this scale, and basically, very quickly, somebody, uh, I was telling a, a colleague of mine who wrote this paper, we changed the paradigm that the extinction crisis was not normal in 2015 in a paper that become very important in that sense. And basically, when we talk about investment, we need billions, trillions of dollars probably in the next 20, 30 years to do it, the job. And if we don't do that, it's when I, uh, and, but this is probably 1% of the GDP of the planet, and very quickly, as if you go to the doctor and say, you, you may have cancer, but it will cost you $1. And you have $10,000 $10, in the bank, you say, no, no, it's too expensive. That's exactly the same. So uh, at the local level, there are many things working out. I have a small foundation. We're only three of us. But in Mexico, we have been working with the local communities. They own a big chunk of land in the border with the, uh, Guatemala. And we have made agreements. We're protecting now one million hectares of forest. And we are going to try to protect one and a half million hectares. 
And in one of those deals, 200,000 hectares, around 450,000 acres, is costing us, is costing us around $2 million a year. That's all. I think if we will invest ten, something like $5 billion in the planet for the next, every year for the next year, we will save all the tropical forests and all the forests that are required for human survival. So I, I want to um, follow up on, uh, I alluded in, the, in my sort of opening remarks to the connection between climate and biodiversity. Monica, you alluded to this. Um, uh, Gerardo, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I mean, could you just explain to the audience why biodiversity is not just about protecting species, but also uh, about protecting all of us uh, and links to the climate? That's a very crisis. good question. Uh, people always say, well, I'm so sorry, the species will have to become extinct if we are going to survive. Let me give you very quick examples. We scientists call ecosystem services, all the benefits we get from the, the nature, the proper work of nature, like the pr proper combination of the gases of the atmosphere. If this uh, wall is made of bricks, every time we take a brick, the wall is start to work less properly. And so, uh, sooner or later, it will take one of those bricks, one of the species will collapse. So basically, we depend, life on the planet depends on all the plants and animals and the functional ecosystems to have the conditions to have life in general and to have human lives in particular. So every time we lose a species, every time we destroy a forest, we're eroding the capabilities of the planet to maintain life in general and to maintain human life in particular. And I finish with this. We really think there may be a possibility of a collapse of civilization. The way we have been uh, enjoying uh, these uh, great opportunities by living in great places and so on in the next few, a few years unless we do a massive effort with no uh, similar to what we did in the world in order to stop the problem. I like that image of, of uh, ecosystems as a wall of bricks and we're pulling uh, the bricks away. Monica, I'd like to ask you the same question but then with one twist which is just um, how do you uh, think about trying to bring these conversations into climate conversations where they're missing? Uh, how, do you, how do you bring that message and that knowledge to those conversations? Well, I, um, thinking back to my first uh, COP, if you can believe it, my first climate COP was uh, Glasgow, and I'll never forget Boris Johnson, you know, having led that um, effort to bring that uh, cop together said, it's not just about hugging bunnies. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, it is. We love bunnies. We love nature and biodiversity, but we love a planet that's healthy and that sustains us. And so it's not hard to bring those conversations together. I've seen over the last two cops an increasing emphasis, climate cops, an increasing emphasis on biodiversity. I think we have an upcoming UN water conference that will bring together biodiversity and, and a healthy environment. Water is essential to life. It's also a huge part of the climate crisis, either drought or um, coastal and, and um, inundate, inundating floods. So I think increasingly these conversations are coming together. And if you throw in the pandemic, which is another place where the loss of biodiversity has cost us dearly, if we could conserve the places that we need for climate and biodiversity and for zoonotic spillover prevention, oh my gosh, we've solved the world's biggest crises and we've saved probably a lot of money and so many lives. So to me, the conversations are naturally coming together. People do understand these things are interconnected, but we have to keep talking about nature and biodiversity. It can't all be um, just about sort of uh, clean technologies and sort of the, the more um, market-driven, um, currently market-driven, but hopefully we'll be changing the way markets work and they'll take biodiversity and nature into account. It can't just be about energy transition. Right, we need to recognize the importance of biodiversity for those markets to function, right? I mean, that's an, a hugely important point. Um, uh, Gerardo, do you want to just answer that same question that, you know, how do you better mainstream the biodiversity conversation? Uh, just to close us off, we have just a few seconds left. Uh, well, first of all, places like this. I, I concur that uh, it, the, the, the word is spreading, but you all need to help us to make it louder, to really emphasize every time you talk about climate change, please remember that biodiversity relies on you and we rely on biodiversity. Can I throw in one last thing? Uh, relying on you, please recycle your plastic badge outside. There are bins for it. That's how you can help 
just today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some news, uh, some uh, some information to use right away. But thank you for this really informative uh, conversation uh, to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be here with you, friends. Today we stand at the precipice of a truly consequential moment in our collective efforts to fight the climate crisis. Every indicator on climate is telling us that we are losing the race to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement alive and prevent the worst effects of the climate crisis. Globally, carbon pollution is at its highest level in human history and continues to rise when science tells us that we should be cutting carbon pollution by 7% annually. At current levels of warming, we are witnessing unprecedented climate impacts on every continent, in every region, and in every country, including the United States. We're seeing floods, droughts, superstorms, and wildfires. Mega cities on every continent face uncertain futures, including this great city of Miami. Friends, keeping the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement is not simply about hitting an arbitrary number. This is ultimately about saving and protecting lives and livelihoods and preventing climate chaos in our economies. The good news is that despite the complexity and the enormity of the challenge ahead of us, we have never been better equipped with financial and technological tools to address this crisis and to seize the opportunity from a clean energy and resilient future for all. But this will require urgent action on three critical fronts. First, ending our fossil fuel addiction and jump-starting a renewables revolution. Let us not forget the renewables revolution presents a monumental economic opportunity for the United States and for every economy. But we need to remove the obstacles to ensuring fair and just transitions all over the world. The obstacles are well known. The most pervasive are the high cost of capital, access to critical technologies and critical raw materials, and policy and regulatory barriers. And these obstacles are not insurmountable. The cost of capital for renewable investments could be as much as seven times higher in the developing world. We don't lack the finance or liquidity in the global financial system to hit the four trillion needed a year for renewable investments in the developing world. We know that the bulk of these investments must come from the private sector. This is why we need the multilateral development banks and other sources of public and low-cost finance to step up and step in and work with private finance to get the money flowing to make these investments affordable and bankable. Major reform of the international financial architecture and the multilateral development banks like the World Bank is urgently needed. They need to overhaul their business models to, to be more creative and risk-taking. We also need the providers of private capital and credit rating agencies to significantly improve how they perceive and measure risks in developing countries, especially in Africa. And we need to remove the barriers to technology and knowledge sharing on critical technologies such as battery storage and make them essential and freely available global public goods. The UN Secretary General continues to advocate for creating a global coalition on battery storage to fast track innovation and deployment, a coalition led and driven by governments and bringing together technology companies, manufacturers and financiers. We also need to work together to build diverse and resilient supply chains for critical raw materials necessary for the energy transition while ensuring that source countries communities and peoples in the developing world are not exploited. Second, we must urgently protect those on the front lines of the climate crisis. 
One of the great injustices of the climate crisis is that those that have contributed the least to the problem are already paying the highest price, even in rich countries like the United States. Over the past 50 years, close to 70% of all deaths from climate-related disasters have occurred in the least developed countries, the 46 poorest countries in our world, home to 1 billion people, and these countries emit less than 4% of global emissions annually, the emissions of Japan. The adaptation needs of developing countries must be seriously addressed. We are mobilizing a mere $20 billion a year to support adaptation in the developing world when we know their needs are as much as $340 billion a year. This injustice must cease. These countries lack access to basic tools to save lives and protect livelihoods like early warning systems. And this is why the Secretary General, he has asked for early warning systems to be provided to every person on earth by 2027. Join us in this important point. Third and finally, we need to strengthen international cooperation and create a culture of transparency, accountability, and credibility. One country alone cannot solve the climate crisis. Climate should be an area for cooperation and collaboration, not conflict and confrontation. And Jason, I agree with you. We need more trade rather than less trade in clean energy. The Secretary General, he's championed new models of cooperation, like the Just Energy Transition Partnerships organized around South Africa, Indonesia, and Vietnam. We need the private sector to also lead, but we must end the public relations stunts and exercises in corporate greenwashing, and instead insist that corporates put forward credible and credible and transparent transition plans for achieving net zero. Friends, it is now or never. As Martin Luther King Jr. said six decades ago, this is not the time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. We need bold and urgent action now. In less than six months, leaders will meet in New York at the UN Secretary General's Climate Ambition Summit, and then at the inaugural global stock take at COP28 in the UAE. These will be important and critical political moments this year to bring the world in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we have stark choices ahead of us, climate chaos or a prosperous, sustainable, and resilient renewable energy future for all. The solutions and the pathways to securing this future are before us. We know what to do and we know how to get there. We need to roll up our sleeves and simply get to work. And finally, to the many young people that I've seen in the corridors over the course of the last few hours. I share, we share your frustration, but I urge you, Never give up this fight for your future. The United Nations is here to support you. Continue to hold us and your leaders to account. This is your future. I thank you. We, I am really excited uh, to talk to these amazing gentlemen today and let me introduce them really quickly. John Englander is an oceanographer, author, and, in, and international speaker and expert on climate change and sea level rise. He lives here in Boca Raton, but has taken multiple expeditions to Greenland and Antarctica, where he sees firsthand the impact of the melting and the rising seas. And next to him is Brett Stevens, op-ed columnist for the New York Times since 2017. Before that, Brett worked as a columnist and editor for the Wall Street Journal, and in between time, I think, spent some time as the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. Uh, in 2013, he won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. So this is an interesting pairing, and you're probably wondering, why are these two, two people together? So let me just set that up a little bit. In April of 2017, Brett wrote his first column for the New York Times, in which he expressed 
that there were unacceptable levels of claimed scrutiny or claimed certainty around climate change, and he kind of scoffed at the idea that it was a catastrophic threat to humanity. Well, as you might imagine, there was a lot of blowback to that, thousands of complaints, a bunch of people wrote a, uh, signed a petition that he should be fired from his job, including John Englander. But now, Brett, as you said later, I might have spared myself the outraged reception to my first column if it hadn't been preceded by the name calling of my old columns, such as when I called climate activists a cast of spectacularly unattractive people pretending to an obscure form of knowledge that promises to make the seas retreat and the winds abate. Okay. <laughs> so John, even after that, a couple of years after that column and after the big hubbub, you reached out to Brett, you, it was like a cold call, and you offered to take him to Greenland to see for himself what was going on. Why did you reach out to this person? Well, after I'd signed the petition to try and get him fired, which didn't work, um, I started reading his columns, and I actually really liked the way he wrote and thought and his uh, healthy skepticism on so many global issues. And uh, I really thought to myself, well, maybe I missed something in that original column. So I went back and read it, and it really wasn't quite as um, strident as some people would, would, might think. Um, it just caused a knee-jerk reaction by scientists in the climate community. And I was going to New York to talk to the New York City Bar Association, and I had a day in between flying up, and I just thought, what could I do in New York tomorrow? Maybe I could meet Brett Stevens. We'd never been introduced. I sent him an email at 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon introducing myself and said, would you be willing to meet? He said, sure, meet me at the Times tomorrow at noon. So we spent an hour in his office and got to trust each other. And then I said, you should come to Greenland, which he did. All right, so I know there, there was a pandemic in between when you actually got to go to Greenland, but why, you know, given, given your thoughts of, at the time, the skepticism about, about climate change, about global, war, global warming, why did you agree to go to Greenland? First of all, it's an honor to be on stage with the two of you and at uh, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, conclave. It's, it, I never expected to be here. Uh, second of all, um, my initial thesis about spectacularly unattractive people is being disproved <laughs> uh, just, by, just by looking. Um, uh, so uh, there were a couple of events, and they actually come together in a funny way, not just in this room, but uh, at this table. After I wrote that initial column and there was this tremendous uh, blowback, um, a friend of mine of, of several years, Jason Bordoff, who was just on the stage uh, Earlier, uh, earlier this uh, this afternoon, um, put together a group of um, experts for me to have a conversation with at Columbia. People like Kerry Emanuel, others mostly from academia, um, and unlike some of my more strident critics, they engaged with me. I engaged with them. It was a productive conversation. And then a few months after that, um, out of the blue, this Englander guy <laughs> wrote me, and you know my. My argument in my first column was people should check their certainty or their, uh, check their certitude. And then I thought, well, maybe I should check my certitude as well. So if um, I'm so, uh, how certain can I be that they're too certain? I owe it to myself to test my views. And what's the worst that could happen? I could change my mind. Now, when John approached me, I mean, I'd had a lot of very unpleasant encounters before then, people who wouldn't shake my hand. John approached me in such a friendly spirit that it just seemed churlish not to accept the invitation. And that first meeting led to a conviction that I might have something to learn. And plus, I'm a journalist, so I'm always up for a cool junket, and Greenland <laughs> sounded pretty cool. So there was, the, there was the intervening period of COVID, which actually did more also in its own way to turn my mind, and then we went to Greenland. All right, so we'll get back to the COVID part because I think it changed so much, you know, that many of us think. But when you went to Greenland, what was it that you showed him and what was it that you saw that changed everything? Well, we, we, did a, we first went to Copenhagen, spoke with people like Liam Colgan, um, uh, scientists, then, then the trip to Greenland. It was, it's a marvelous trip, and if you can afford it, you should go on it. Um, or if your organization can afford to send you, in my case, you should, uh, you should go on it. 
The most striking visual for me, and it's not that it was a kind of Damascene, you know, Saul on the road to Damascus kind of moment, but, but the seeing the trim line between the mountain range of Greenland and the ice sheet, that is to say the equivalent of the bathtub rings that you see in American lakes and reservoirs in the West, that immense amount of space that you knew was once covered with ice and has then retreated was a very impactful visual. It was one of those moments when you go, I, I, I'm looking at it. There is something utterly undeniable here that I have to take account of. Um, and that combined with my realization during the pandemic that there are moments, uh, someone said earlier, you know, Mother Nature can't, can't, be, can't be defeated. Um, there are moments when nature overwhelms even the most technologically advanced civilizations. So it was this twinning of the personal experience in Greenland having come out of two and a half years of pandemic or two years of pandemic that really galvanized me in a way that I don't think I would have been galvanized. So why were you so sure that he would have changed his mind? Well, the thing he forgot to mention was that the other thing about Greenland that's rather unique is the scale. There were icebergs the size of this building. And I remember, in fact, you estimated the size of five New York City blocks as you were, you were looking at them one night. The, uh, we've all seen glaciers maybe in Alaska or the Alps or uh, you know, Glacier National Park or something like that. The scale of Greenland is times 100. It, it just, we're talking two miles of ice. There's enough ice there that if it melts, the global sea level raises 24 feet. And it's melting. In fact, there was a headline this week in the Washington Post that it's melting faster than ever, record heat. So there's a visual there, and also it's like a retreat. It's like it's a classic retreat, going away for four days and thinking about something as opposed to the normal one hour block. But I was pretty sure that I would, I would uh, persuade Brett, because I, I knew he was a, a logical thinker, that um, I found that in about 20 minutes, I can persuade anybody that climate change is caused by us, that it's gonna get serious, and while we should do all the things that we're talking about here, we also need to begin adapting for higher sea level, which is now somewhat unavoidable. Okay, John, we've gotta clone you and just get you out there talking yep. to everybody, but since that can't happen, and since we can't take everybody to Greenland, which yes. would also be pretty bad for the environment. Yes. Um, do you think that given that, yes, a lot of stuff is happening now, but the worst of it is some, some generation forward, right? Some years in the future. How is it that climate skeptics, to say nothing of climate deniers, can be persuaded? And John, let me ask you first, and then, and then Brett, as a, somebody who's kind of come around on this, I'd like to hear from you as well. Well, Climate is complex, of course. Everything from everything you've mentioned in the last three days. Uh, sea level is a little different. It's really binary. Either the water is this height or it's that height, and the shoreline moves. And the fact that it's going to change the shoreline for 140 nations. And people say to me all the time, oh, well, sea level rise is a Miami problem. I say, it's not a Miami problem. It's a problem for every coastal city in the world. It's going to change the coastline for the first time in 6,000 years. And we know from geologic history that it's been far higher and the shoreline's been inland. So that I use the real physics or geol geology and the simplicity of it to make the case that sea level rise is different. And the ice is going to melt in Greenland for a long time because of the heat that's already in the system, even without the issues of trying to reduce the more greenhouse gases. So we have to plan for the future now. And it's an opportunity as much as it's a problem. All right, so you, you're, you're telling them the facts. And Brett, what do you do? You know, I actually have a very different impression from John here, not only of, 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 of in, in the following sense. I, one of the reasons I appreciated my trip to Greenland, just as I appreciated the panel that Jason put together for me, is that I think, um, on the whole, my experience of Greenland complexified the issue. And Jason's, my conversation with Jason was with thinkers who were complexifiers. And you heard that with the presentation with, with Jason. Things are really complicated. There are, there are an endless series of trade-offs. And 
I'm not an expert on climate, but I might be an expert on persuasion, having been a columnist for 25 years. And I would argue that you will sooner win over skeptics. I won't, let's not talk about deniers, okay. but skeptics by complexifying the issue than by attempting to simplify it. Because simplifications often involve shortcuts and intelligent people have questions about those shortcuts. Presenting a very full picture, thinking through questions of risk and what is acceptable risk is a way of engaging intelligent skeptics at a higher level. And if you can do that, you will win over people like me because we're not stupid and we're not evil, but our questions aren't being answered. Um, address, pitch your, treat your opponent as if he or she is an intelligent and worthy person operating in good faith, and that's the way John came to me, and I think you get much farther with the argument. And also by adding, by adding the note, let's just find a way to agree on the, on the problem. Let's diagnose the disease. Then let's open it up to a possibility of prescriptions because we don't have a monopoly on truth any more than you do. But how much, I mean, you mentioned not treating people as if they're evil, and yet we do seem to be at a moment in our country, if not a larger, if not a larger group of people, that that is how people treat people they don't agree with, as they're evil, as they're bad, you know, as they they should be. I, I don't know, they just should go away, shut up is the nicest thing you could say. So how do we get back to that civility to have that conversation? So my, my liberal colleague and I, Gail Collins, have a conversation in the New York Times every week, and amazingly, it's wildly popular because underneath the noise and the algorithms of outrage, there is a real hunger in this country for civilized, civilized and productive disagreements between two people who, uh, who might not share the same views, but at least want overall the same good goals. Believe it or not, even the climate skeptics want to live in a habitable planet. They just have, in my view, an incomplete view of what is required to achieve it. Abraham Lincoln had a wonderful line. It's actually an aphorism. A drop of honey draws more flies than a gallon of gall. Right. And it's, it's old advice. It's really good advice. It's a really good way to win over people who are, in fact, winnable. They're not in the pockets of oil corporations. They're not irreducibly stupid. They want to hear arguments that treat them like mature human beings capable of reaching mature conclusion. I mean, you've written two books about rising seas. I would assume that you agree that people are persuadable if you go in there with the right approach. Absolutely. Yeah, not only, um, and it just makes common sense. If you really disagree with somebody, you scream at them and throw things at them, it's not going to get them to change their position. But if you can engage them on a point of fact, like did you know that sea level used to be 400 feet lower? or that it used to be 25 feet higher. Well, that surprises people. Or did you know that icebergs melting don't add to sea level rise? Which is really surprising to most people. There's a way to engage people and say, wait a minute, is it, can that be true? You know, tell me. And once you get a dialogue going, you can, you can really do some education. Um, by the way, there are four places to go to Greenland this summer. We've expanded our trips at, at Brett's um, encouragement. And uh, I, for whatever it's worth, there are four places. All right, now, Brett, when, I think we all know when skeptics become converts, converts to anything, really, they become the best proselytizers. So I know you wrote a 6,000-word story in the New York Times back in uh, October talking, talking about this. Um, how hard was it for you to kind of wildly publicly say, you know, I've changed my mind about this? Because a lot of people won't do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I was joking with my editor who's like, how's it coming along? And I'm like, Nick, I'm dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder here and uh, give me time. So uh, um, it felt good. Uh, it feels good to kind of come to an honest reassessment with your own views. And by the way, because I'm an instinctive contrarian, I can't, I can't get that out of my, my system. I think I still manage to piss people off with some of my, my somewhat contrarian conclusions. The, 
the, the main thing, though, is that it's not impossible to change your mind. It is, in fact, a sign of intellectual maturity and sophistication. And um, um, and also, it's, it's, it's possible to engage on, I think, a much deeper level. Because again, I mean, from what I've seen of this, this conference, you know, the, the kinds of trade-offs and challenges that climate presents the world are, are so serious, so difficult, that you have, to, you have to find a way to engage, and you're gonna have to find a way to engage across lines that previously haven't been crossed. We're getting nowhere. We're getting nowhere with the current dialogue that we have. It shouldn't have to be that way. You can start having really productive conversations. Again, I said this before, coming to people and saying, hey, listen, we're not in possession of 100% of the truth. Let's talk about the kinds of solutions that could begin to make sense. My own view is we don't need one solution. We need 500 solutions. And lots of people can, be part can participate in that multiplicity of solutions, not the one big idea that's gonna save the world. One of my favorite parts of the story that Brett wrote um, in October on you know, coming around was at the very end, I think there were nine things, nine practical things that, that we should do. And, and you know, one of them just said that don't allow climate to become a mainly left of center concern. So what can scientists do to, to stop that? Because that's kind of where it is right now. Um, the scientists have a lot to, to learn in terms of better communication, frankly. One of the things that I do that's a bit different, I mean, I really use plain language. I don't even use the word mitigation. That's not a common word in most people's vocabulary. And it means two totally different things. It refers to reducing greenhouse gases and slowing the warming, or reducing the flooding by resiliency designs. Those are both mitigation. So uncommon word meaning two totally different things in the same field. We need to talk clearly. The more fundamental one is we talk about getting carbon out of the atmosphere. We're not talking getting carbon out of the atmosphere. That's about as true as saying I'm drinking hydrogen and oxygen, which we know of as water, H2O. Carbon dioxide is a clear gas. Carbon is a black substance. So we, need, we scientists need to be much clearer in our communication. Use simple words. Don't try and impress people with jargon and, and technical stuff. So that's one, and I always use simple visuals that anybody can follow, whether they're, you know, a scientist or an arts major. Uh, I th so I think we all have to do that, but it really is a matter of coming together. Not only is everybody here aware of the crisis of climate change um, and the need to do lots more, lots quicker, as the last few speakers have, have uh, supported, but we are past the point of no return. And the ice is going to keep melting for centuries now just because of the heat that's already stored in the sea. Now, it's happened before in nature. If you learn a little bit, as I point out in both my books, 120,000 years ago, sea level was 25 feet higher. Most people don't know that. So we have, to we have to learn the science, but in plain language and simplify it. And I think sea level rise in particular presents one of the biggest challenges, of course, particularly for places, not just Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa, Jacksonville, and all around the world. Um, but it's going to change the landforms. It's going to change nations. 30 nations will disappear this century underwater. We have time to begin adapting. And um, I, is it, you know, terrible? Yeah, lots of things are terrible, okay, in the world. But this is one actually, if we just take a deep breath and realize that the sea will be higher, Let's tr work hard to keep it to three feet of rise, not 13 feet of rise. If we, if we just focus on that as calmly as we can and realize this is the time to start designing for the future, that 100 years from now, what we do today will have proven smart and foresighted, farsighted, um, things that were investing in a different world while we were trying to do all the other ecological things and greenhouse gas things. But sea level is going to be higher. So it's an opportunity to really invest in the future, but we've got to think big. Brett, you're Just gonna get the last very word. Very briefly to answer your question. There are two ways in which I think conservatives ought to be animated on the subject of uh, climate. Number one, 
it's going to be a tremendous field for innovation. And those who are conservative on the libertarian side should see this as an opportunity for huge technological game-changing advances in the future that work with the grain of a capitalist free market economy, not against the grain. The second thing is that if being a conservative means anything, it means that you care about generations not yet born. Um, some of the effects of climate, the, the ones that scare us, we'll, we'll be dead for in all likelihood. But our great-grandchildren will be alive for them. And if a conservative is supposed to mean anything, it's the belief that you have fiduciary responsibilities for future generations, which behooves moral action today rather than letting it go for the future. So on those two points alone, I think that's the way in which you begin to engage people whose views you currently don't share. One last thing. Um, there's a wonderful saying, um, the guy who founded APAC, very successful lobby, once said, we have no enemies. We only have friends and potential friends. And I would just in urge the climate community to, to operate on that same principle. You have no enemies. We all care about the climate. You have friends and you have potential friends. Work on that potential. Okay. I want to thank my friends, Brett and John. I want to thank you all, and I mostly want to thank Aspen Ideas Climate for this really thought-provoking and inspirational last few days. Thank you very much. So I'm Dan Gelber. I'm the mayor of the city, and I regularly am asked to appear at the convention center to welcome people who are here, conference of dietitians, conference of actuaries, whatever they may be. I kill with the actuaries because they always laugh at jokes about rinding, rounding up. It's really a big thing. Um, but this is something that's very personal to my city. In fact, I think it's personal to the world, which is this idea of that we're, ch we're really facing a challenge that is, I, I can't say it's fully unprecedented, but when I think about the Aspen Institute, it was born out of World War II. It was born out of the great conflicts that the whole world had to focus on to move to the next to the next era. And so I just want to thank all of you because for my city this is a lot more important than just giving a good time to people who are here and creating moments that they that they cherish. It is about solving the great challenge of our world today. And I want to thank Dan and the Aspen staff for everything they do in trusting us to be a host. And I want to thank my people, the city of Miami Beach, and of course, Michelle Berger, who is now a cult figure in this uh, group, for all the work all of them have done. Really, it's been our privilege to have you here this last, uh, these last three days, and we look forward to you visiting our city annually until we solve this problem. Thank you, Mayor Gelber, and all of you for being here. Uh, my thoughts and thanks uh, to your team, because they've been working on this for 10 months since last year's summit in May. Um, and Michelle, again, on behalf of the Aspen Institute, thank you so much. There's two other cult figures here. Uh, Kitty Boone is all the way in the back. Kitty leads our public programs. Kitty, thank you so much. Icon might be better. Yeah, yeah, okay, icon. Uh, but uh, then the other icon, the, the Eddie Vetter of the Aspen Institute is Greg Gershoni, who leads our energy and environment program. Incredible leader. And their teams. And we're, we're wearing these um, hummingbird pins, as I said on the opening night, because one of our young colleagues passed away tragically just weeks before uh, this summit, Melanie Diaz, from South Florida, had worked on the summit last year and this year, and all of our staffs, the Miami Beach staff, the Aspen staff, uh, all the public affairs staff, all are communicating, coordinating, uh, and trying to bring you the best possible summit in Melanie's honor. Um, and so It's, it's such a pleasure to see thinkers and leaders and doers from every sector, from business, to see innovators, to see leaders in government like Monica Medina, to see artists and photographers, uh, to um, have scientists, uh, to have all the different people that have something to contribute together, uh, gather together in the work breakout groups and the big sessions, really working the problem for understanding and for solutions. We loved having so many young leaders here uh, this year and every year, 
and those young leaders are uh, taking their place, and it's great to see. And all of you who are supporting the younger people in your communities as they stand up and contribute, giving them the space, the resources, and, uh, and the faith to do what they can do for this, we all thank you. The Aspen Institute is so much about investing in our young people. Um, as I look around right now, I see a number of friends that we've made over the last year since we've been here in, uh, in Miami Beach in year two. And it's really fun for me to be able to look out and see people that have come together now multiple times because we want to get something done for the world. And so I thank each one of you for your commitment and your work. Uh, our hope is that we'll learn a lot from this year's summit and so then provide a summit next year that builds on the lessons learned, continues the momentum in many areas, invites new voices into the conversation, roots ourselves that much more deeply in the greater uh, South Florida communities, and has more impact in the world beyond. And I'm, I'm positive that will happen because I saw how much has happened in the last 10 months since our first summit here. So if you have ideas or suggestions, if you feel as if there's another angle that we should be looking to provide. We do a lot of work uh, in the time between summits. We have a whole giant program focusing on these issues that Greg leads. Uh, please be in touch with me at my name at the Aspen Institute or with Greg, and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts as we start to brainstorm with this incredible public servant uh, about the next summit. Thank you all. Thank you. See you next year.